In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So this last spring, I really enjoyed teaching from St. Paul's letter to the Romans to our women's Bible study with a twist group. And of course, over the spring, we went through the entire book and we followed quite a few twists and turns through St. Paul along the way. But one of the major themes of this letter to the Romans from Paul is this idea that we as Christians are to be in Christ. This is a phrase that Paul uses frequently in the letter to the Romans, that we are to be in Christ, meaning that the way that we live, the way that we relate to one another, the way that we communicate is to be in Christ. We take on the way of Christ in our very being, in our identity. And in this section of Romans that we just heard today, Paul explains this even more. To be in Christ, says Paul, is to be in the Spirit. To have the Holy Spirit guide us and be with us in all of our decisions, and all of our actions. For Paul, you see, Jesus being the Son of God is inseparable from Jesus being marked by the Holy Spirit. Jesus being the Son of God is inseparable from Jesus being marked by the Holy Spirit. It's all connected. And although Paul would never have named it this explicitly, what Paul's talking about is what we would call the Holy Trinity. So today, Trinity Episcopal Church, and of course the church as a whole, are celebrating the Feast of the Holy Trinity. And perhaps this quick summary of what St. Paul said about the Trinity Trinity doesn't quite explain for you what the Trinity is. So let's go a little bit farther into that. First of all, the Trinity is God. But I imagine for someone who's new to the church or not familiar with the concept of the Trinity, this still might be rather confusing. We say we believe in one God, But right here in the scripture and throughout our worship, we frequently pray to and talk about and bless in the name of the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? The problem, of course, is that we often try to explain the Trinity with quick, simple metaphors. Maybe you've heard some of these quick, simple metaphors before. Here's one. God in the Trinity is like three states of water. Ice, steam, and liquid, right? Maybe you've heard that one. Or maybe you've heard, God and the Trinity is like three parts of an egg, shell, white, and yolk. Or maybe there's the, there's, there's the famous one that, bought the, from the, supposedly from St. Patrick. God and the Trinity is like a shamrock, three equal parts of the same plant. You see, these are all metaphors that are trying to get at the same thing, trying to explain how do you have three things that are also one thing. But all of these explanations, these metaphors fall short because they either move into almost heresy because one part of the example is completely different than the other part of the example, and frankly, God is not like that, or the metaphor simply isn't strong enough to explain the complexity of God So basically, are we just stuck without the ability to actually understand the Trinity? Well, I wouldn't say that. One of the things that makes this day unique among all the feasts of our church is it's the only feast devoted to a doctrine of the church. And that's one of the things that we can say about the Trinity. It is a doctrine agreed upon throughout church history. We, the people of God's church, have agreed to talk about God and think about God and refer to God as Trinity, or three parts, one substance. As Episcopal Bishop Dean Wolf put it, the doctrine of the Trinity is a celebration of the triumph of the infinite hues of complexity over a monochromatic simplicity, 
We celebrate the infinite hues of complexity over the monochromatic simplicity. And you see, I think this complexity is really important. There's always a part of us that would love to say, hey, I've got God all figured out. Right? I mean, I'd like to say that, but I never really can. Because you see, we love to think that the world is a simple place. But that's just not how creation works. If we actually think about our experience of creation, we, all, we immediately figure out that the diversity of creation is so much more vast than the little corner of the world that we actually experience. And when we think about it, we realize that God must be larger than any statement about God that we can make. In fact, God is so vast and so beyond our conceptualizations that they're not actually words in existence capable of fully describing God. All language about God, therefore, is ultimately metaphorical. So, if metaphors about describing God and Trinity fall short of explaining the Trinity, and if Trinity is still a metaphor, how do we understand it? Well, perhaps a story. So I'm going to tell you this story with the full disclosure that even this story is going to fall short. So just keep in mind, this story is going to fall short because no, nothing will fully get there because God and Trinity is so much more complex than any story we tell. And I also want to mention, here's another disclosure, this story just happens to be a story about me going on a hike. And I know just recently I told you a story about me going on a hike. Not all my stories are about me going on hikes, but this was a good one, so I thought I would just tell you this one too. But the truth is, often we see God in nature, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things that is true for me. I experience God in nature, and perhaps you do too. So here's this story. A few years ago, I had this extraordinary experience of being able to officiate a wedding in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. Beautiful, beautiful place. And one morning while I was there, I find the time to take a hike at the state park there. And the trail leads up this mountainside. It's a curvy, windy trail through trees, etc. And all along the way, there are these different vistas where you can stop and look back out at the lake. And the Lake Tahoe is this incredible, beautiful lake that's ringed by mountains, snow-capped mountains, just a gorgeous, gorgeous place to be. And at multiple points along the trail, I arrive at places where I can stop at these views and, and look at these breathtaking uh, vistas, and I have to stop to, to see and, and also to catch my breath because it is uphill. And, um, but I, just being the glory of creation, so my ultimate hiking destination I had seen on the brochure is at the very top of this mountain was a waterfall. And I was looking to go see this beautiful waterfall at the very top of the trail uh, at the top of the mountain. But I'm walking on this trail, I'm by myself, and there, there are other people on the trail, but at the place where I am, I'm just by myself walking, stopping, looking, walking, not really pushing myself. And as I walk, I, I first hear and then I see coming up behind me three rambunctious, frisky Australian shepherd dogs. They, they come running up behind, just loping behind as fast as they can, and they're playful, and they come up, and, and I turn, and there they are, and they're very, very friendly, and I greet them, and I say, hey, dogs, what are you doing? And they jump up and lick me, and they're just, you know, very, very friendly dogs. And soon, not too far behind, I hear and then see there are three owners, three very fit athletic men carrying walking sticks coming up the path at a much faster pace than I was going. And they come up and they're very friendly and they say hello, but they're clearly intending to head on. And then the dogs take off, the men take off, and I'm thinking, well, I'm not going that fast, so I just, just slowly follow behind. But then, to my surprise, one of the dogs circles back to come check on me, to come see where I am. And I thought, well, that's really nice. And I say, well, hey, dog, thanks for checking on me. I'll be fine. You just go on. And uh, the dog circles back, and I keep going, but then the dog circles back again, and it keeps circles back, and she's, she keeps checking on me. Basically, she's adopted me as part of her pack. And I'm thinking, well, shoot, I think I have to go faster and keep up with him because this dog... <laughs> 
it's, it's going to keep checking on me, you know, and I'm you know, peer pressure from a dog, but I mean, I've got I've to go. So or I put my head down and I start walking faster to catch up on this trail. And now the whole rest of the pack and these men, they're, they're so far beyond. And this is a curvy trail through, through woods and things. They're, they're so far gone, I don't know where they are. But this dog keeps coming back and then leading, keeps coming back and leading. So I keep following her. Uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, we never catch up with the rest of the pack, but I'm right behind this dog the whole way. And then soon, I start to notice, following this dog, that the trail has disappeared. And in fact, we're somewhere in the middle of this piney woods on the side of the mountain, and there is no trail. I'm somehow lost on the side of a mountain. Of course, the problem that I had not factored into my little plan in following the dog is maybe she didn't know where she was going. <laughs> and so finally, I, I say to her, dog, maybe we need to turn around. And at that moment, the dog was just wallowing around in this little creek, just being an all dog, having the most fun in her life. And she looked at me when I said her name, dog, and she looked up at me. And when I said, maybe we need to turn around, she jumped up and by golly, she ran the other way. And I was like, all right. So I turned and followed her back the other direction. And we go back about 10 minutes and indeed we find the trail. She finds the trail, I follow her. And then we get to the spot on the trail where there is a small sign that says waterfall this way. And it's right back next to this giant boulder. And in fact, at that place, the trail had curved but I hadn't seen it, and that's where the dog and I had, had missed the curve, and we had just left the trail at that point, and I'd, I had missed it at that place. Well, once we got back to that place, the dog just took on off. I never saw her again. She went to find the rest of her pack, and I head on up the waterfall path from there, much slower than they had been going, and after about 20 more minutes, I finally make it to the waterfall, and it is beautiful. It is breathtaking. And looking back out at the lake, the views are just indescribably beautiful. So incredible. And the spray of the water on me was so refreshing, incredible. Uh, just, just an amazing experience. So finally, I start heading back down the mountain. And along the way, I encounter groups that are on their way up the mountain to see the waterfall. And they ask me, you know, how is the waterfall? Oh, it's beautiful. How far is it? It's just 10 more minutes. It's just 20 more minutes. It's just 30 more minutes. But I was able to say to them, don't miss the curve at the boulder. Make sure you make that curve at the boulder. And you see, this, I think, is what Paul is talking about today in his letter to the Romans. This is what it means, metaphorically, to be in Christ. And it's very much our Christian experience with the God of the Trinity. There's reasons we hear so much about mountaintops in the scriptures. The word of God comes from the mountaintop to Moses. The spirit descends onto mountaintops. Jesus teaches from mountaintops. Jesus sends forth his disciples to preach from mountaintops. And it's in the Trinity that we realize that the God is not a distant and judgmental God, but instead a loving God who walks with us daily in our trials and tribulations. You see, the God of the Trinity is walking the mountain path with us as we seek our waterfalls. This God of the Trinity is with us when we miss the sign and plunge ourselves off the path into dangerous areas. And the God of the Trinity is with us when we wander back on course and we find our heading. And the God of the Trinity is with us when we make our way back down the mountain and share with others the path of beauty and joy and love. I, for one, am grateful that when we describe God, it's not simple. It's actually pretty complex. So today we celebrate this feast of the Trinity. We celebrate this God with us. We celebrate the goodness of God in all places. And as we do all of this, we do it in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.